Structural finite element analysis can seem quite scary, especially when you drill down the formulas behind how it's actually derived. It is also a very important tool to solve complex structural problems. And like any structural tool you use, you need to understand the underlying mechanics behind it, otherwise you don't know where the errors are. So garbage in will equal garbage out. And finite element analysis is no different. Although you don't need to know how to derive FEA from first principles, there are important aspects of FEA analysis that you need to know before you jump into that analysis software. I'll be going through the important aspects of the things you actually need to know about the mechanics of FEA. My name is Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. Before we get into it, I'd just like to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of this video, Onboard Data, who's running a global hackathon where you can win real cash prizes. The competition will bring your data analysis and data mining skills to the forefront where you'll be getting data from over 200 buildings from the sensors that are inside the building. And the competition will be judged on the following criteria. You need to show how you can make buildings more efficient and utilize that data that they've been supplied to you. Number three is one of the key aspects of this and it's about how your solution can help decarbonize the running of a building. And it's also about how you've analyzed it and using open data sources. Good luck. FEA models allows you to solve many structural problems from static analysis, dynamic analysis, buckling analysis, and modal assessments. It's really powerful for solving those complex structural issues, such as deep transfer structures, irregular two-way slabs, complex stability systems, and it can even be drilled down on little elements such as steel connections. So if you've got a big space frame and you've got a little nodal junction about how all the struts are going in, you can Locally assess that structure about where the loads are going, what types of welds you need, and maybe even thicking up the members locally in that area. So FEA can be utilized in either the macro or micro applications. So it has a really wide variety of use cases. An FEA assessment breaks down a complex structural system into either 1D, 2D, or 3D elements. A 1D element is essentially a line or stick element framing system. So you can either have a complex system with portal frames or continuous beam structures. It's only defined as a line that needs to have properties assigned to it, such as second moment of area, torsional stiffness, area, and so on, so you can understand the mechanical properties of where the loads are going in your structure. But to really simplify those beam elements down to a stick frame. Next step up in complexity is the 2D elements. And this is what people traditionally think as FEA assessment. It's where you break down your structure into a series of flat plates. This breaking down the structure into these elements is called decoratization. And the whole group on the whole structure is called the structural mesh. There is two types of plate elements that you can have. You can either have triangular elements or rectangular elements. You also need to be careful with the level of mesh that you have. You want to make sure that's somewhat consistent as much as possible. As a varying mesh can lead to errors. You also want to make sure that you're trying to maintain rectangular mesh wherever possible, as the triangular plates can reduce the accuracy of your assessment. That's not to say that you shouldn't use triangular elements, as they're really good at framing up irregular shapes, such as curves, corners, and other aspects like that. So in your FEA assessment, you can have a combination of triangular and rectangular mesh. The other aspects of using plate elements is that you want to refine the mesh further and further in areas where you actually want to get the results. As the smaller the mesh is, the more accurate the results are going to be. As you're framing up the structure with a series of plates, the one thing that you do need to assign to a plated element is its thickness, as you can either form up a 2D or 3D shape out of plates, but it doesn't know the thickness. So that's the one aspect that you need to assign to a plate element system. There is one more step up from your 2D plated system, and that is 3D elements. I'm essentially building a block model. So you're essentially building out the thickness, depth, and everything inside the structure. And these do follow the same rules that you can either form up triangular shapes, such as pyramids or cuboid shapes. The one real problem about forming up a 3D element is the level of complexity as it's an exponential growth from 1D, 2D to 3D elements. 3D elements are also hard to get the results out of. So typically you try and avoid them where you can and where you can idealize the shapes as much as possible. A FEA assessment doesn't also need to stick to a 1D, 2D or 3D element. You can mix and match them. So where you've got columns or beams, you may be sticking to your stick framing, your 1D element, where you've got flat plates for slabs or things such as wall core walls. You may be sticking to your 2D elements. And if you need to do a local junction connection about how the loads are flowing through, you may move into your 3D element. Typically, you try and stay as either a 2D or a 1D element or a mix of those two. You don't very often step into your 3D uh -huh. assessment as the 3D elements will have an exponential growth on the time that it takes to run that analysis. And the level of assessment you need to do to make sure it's correct 
is also exponential from that point. So it's really hard to drill down on whether you've actually got the accurate result or not. This simplification of the model is known as idealization. To some aspects, you need to be able to idealize the system down to a more simplified method. Also simplifying the problem allows you to debug and making sure the results are correct. So when you're looking at FAA assessments, always looking, how can I make it simpler and more easy to understand? So what areas can I simplify and what areas do I need to keep as plates? And this typically comes with time and just playing with FAA models, how different elements behave and understanding structural mechanics. In addition to the physical geometry of an FAA assessment, you also need to assign it to a material. So those 1D, 2D or 3D elements is just the geometry of the system. Those systems need to be assigned a material as a steel structure will behave differently than a concrete structure of the same size. And pro tip here, so if you've just got big flat plates or big walls, one way that you can mimic cracking in a plated system is to change the material. So by reducing the Young's modulus, so this allows you to flow forces through the design easily. So when you're looking at a structure and you're seeing high tension forces, you can crack those areas locally, where the areas underneath compression can stay at the original Young's modulus of the material. Before setting up that FEA assessment, there's a couple of things that you need to do. We talked about simplification and idealization. You need to break down that complex problem to a more simplest form. So before jumping into the model straight away, maybe doing a couple of hand checks about what sizes you think the structure should be. You can either do this through hand computations, Excel sheets, or using software packages like Structural Toolkit that allow you to assess the structure in its simpler form. So what are the earthquake loads? What are the wind loads? Or what are the stresses are going to be from that local assessment? Now, it's not going to be exactly correct, and the hand computations are normally more conservative, but it gives you a ballpark of whether the FEA analysis has got to the right results or not. As if they're vastly different, you need to drill down and work out which one's correct and which one's wrong. Now, there is also an easy acronym that allows you to make sure you're building out your FEA models correctly. And this is known as GLAD. G is for geometry, L is for load, A is for analysis, and D is for design. First one, G, geometry is about how you're gonna idealize the model. So where you're gonna use your 2D and 1D elements. So how are you gonna simplify the problem? Also, what are the critical areas? As the critical areas that you need to assess, you need to make sure the mesh is more fine in those locations. This is also where you assign the materials to the structure. So what areas are gonna be cracked, what areas aren't? Sometimes you may start with a fully uncracked model, assess it, see where the cracking areas are, and reduce those materials locally in those areas. And you may need to iterate a couple of times until you get to a stable model. With cracking factors as well, there's also guidance in most codes around the world. So make sure you're picking up your local code and seeing what crack factors they would recommend. So if you're wondering about how to assess whether an element is cracked, really look at the flexural forces and compression forces. If it has a really high PA but a high moment, but never sees tension, potentially that area can be uncracked. Or if you've got an element right at the top of the structure where it has low compression, but still that same high moment, there will be cracking occurring and that will make loads distribute differently within your structure. Well, loads, well, that's a pretty easy one to understand. What loads does the structure need to resist? Does it need to resist gravity, lateral pressures, and making sure they're applied in the correct locations. So if you've got a point load, it may be a local point load. Is it a line load or is it a distributed pressure force? Analysis is about what type of analysis do you need to perform on the model? So do you need to perform a static assessment where you're assessing the local stresses and deflections of the structure? Or maybe you need to go down the dynamic assessment where you're assessing the vibrations on the floor and human perceived comfort or buckling. So when it's got a compression force on it, does it buckle underneath that load? Is the element too slender or a modal assessment? Now, a modal assessment is very useful for your lateral assessment. As the building shakes backwards and forwards, which is what you're doing for that modal assessment, the loads can dissipate. So loads can either go up or down for your wind and earthquake loads based on that modal structural assessment. Then after you've done your analysis is obviously D for design. So what type of design and how are you gonna assess the results that you're getting out of your model? So how are you gonna resist the stresses? Where are you gonna put your local reinforcement? How are you gonna design those connections? And how are you gonna perceive that vibration that's felt on the structure? This acronym is really important to make sure you're setting up the model correctly, using the right software and getting the right results out in the end. You're obviously interested in structural analysis. And if you wanna bring your analysis skills up to the next level, I've got a link to a video here or about a simple principle that you may not know, allowing you to understand structural mechanics more thoroughly. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, I've got links to my Patreon in the below description, much like these many Patreons here. Without their support, this type of content would not be possible. And as always, stay safe, keep learning. I'll see you next week. Bye.